budget is insulated compared to other government departments. But it's still under significant pressure, not least from drugs whose prices climb and climb and climb. Newsnight has learned that officials plan to threaten to stop buying some of the most expensive high-tech cancer treatments if the companies that produce them won't cut their prices. The proposals will be revealed tomorrow and they affect the Cancer Drug Fund, a scheme set up in 2010 by David Cameron. With the details, here's our policy editor, Chris Cook. Concern about the NHS's unwillingness to spend money on expensive cancer drugs is a long-running theme. That's why David Cameron announced the Cancer Drugs Fund back in 2010, an England-only £200 million a year specialist pot to pay for drugs that otherwise would be refused for costing too much. Just ask Clive Stone. I met him years ago when we were in opposition. He had cancer and he said to me, the drug I need, it's out there, but they won't give it to me because it's too expensive. Please, if you get in, do something about it. And we have a new cancer drug fund that has got the latest drugs to more than 21,000 people and counting. Newsnight has learned, though, that the cancer drugs fund is now running over budget, and officials are expected to announce tomorrow that it will be increased in size from £200 million a year to £280 million a year, starting from this year. The fund will also be subjected to a new cost-benefit regime. That will mean that the least effective drugs cease to be funded and the most expensive drugs will have to prove their worth if they're to continue to be funded. Some pharmaceutical companies should expect that they will be told that their drugs are now too expensive for the drugs fund that was set up just to pay for the most expensive drugs. This issue all revolves around NICE, the body which decides whether treatments are cost-effective enough to be bought by the NHS. It says that drugs should cost no more than 20 to 30,000 pounds for each extra so-called quality adjusted life year or quali. That basically means a year of life in good health. Now the amount they'll pay for a quali is sometimes higher, like they pay more when they're dealing with end of life drugs. But even so, cancer drugs often just cost way too much. NICE struggles in cancer, and, and that's publicly acknowledged, hence the Cancer Drugs Fund. Um, the issue there really is the advent of the new science means that we have highly targeted medicines against smaller patient populations, but fixed R&D costs. So a new drug costs well over a billion pounds against a very small patient population, a targeted medicine. And therefore what that means is you have higher headline prices per patient. That's fundamentally what's happened over the course of recent years. And uh, This is almost three grand's worth of, uh, of tablets, so it's unbelievable cost. That's why there's demand for the Cancer Drugs Fund. And some of these medicines really do make big differences. In 2008, I was diagnosed with advanced prostate cancer. Um, I was put on to the hormone therapy treatments, which are usual in that situation. And then I carried on through until my levels changed. And I was then advised by my consultant to go on to something called a bitterone acetate. It's a new drug at the time. And uh, this carried on and has allowed me to continue my professional life and my family life to the full and has allowed me again to avoid chemotherapy and any of its effects. This was all only possible because of the Cancer Drugs Fund. But if the Cancer Drugs Fund lacks rules on cost effectiveness, drug companies can just charge very high prices. And when you discuss that problem, one company comes up a lot. Roche, the Swiss pharma giant, accounts for one quarter of Cancer Drugs Fund spending. For example, it produces Catsila, the latest high-cost cancer treatment to be rejected by NICE. Now, Catsila costs £90,000 a throw for an average of a little under six months of extra life. That gives you a cost per quali of £166,000. That's several times more than the most generous of NICE limits. Now, officials really don't want to delist effective drugs, nor do they want to undermine what's a flagship policy for NHS England. But if they don't have the power to say to drug companies, we won't buy at that price, they don't have any negotiating position at all. And with rising numbers of cancer patients, the inability to keep the cost of cancer drugs down is a major concern. This is a tough issue. Roche say that NICE's methods just aren't fit for purpose. Other pharma companies point out that the prices we are willing to pay per quarterly haven't actually moved with inflation. And many people ask whether we should be exempting cancer patients from the NHS's cost control systems at all.
Well, with us tonight are Professor Carol Sikora, who is a renowned cancer specialist, and the pharmacologist and science writer David Colquhoun. Thanks both for coming in. Um, Professor Sikora, why is cancer special? I think because it affects one in three of us, soon to affect one in two of us. It's something, a disease that has awful implications, but in fact we can do a lot. More than 50% of cancer patients are now cured. And we've seen a breakthrough in the number of new drugs. In the last two years, 25 drugs, new drugs, all of them expensive, have been registered for cancer care in Europe. But for sufferers, patients and the families of those with other appalling diseases, why should they accept that cancer, cancer sufferers get preferential financial treatment. I mean, do you accept that is what happens? That is what's happening. The NHS pot is limited, however you look at it. The politicians try and bend it, but it is limited. And if you give more to cancer, you're taking it from somewhere else. Nurses don't syringe ears anymore in some general practices simply because there isn't the funding for their time. David Calhoun, do you accept that that's what we should do? I think the Cancer Drugs Fund is a political stunt in response to shroud waving by the big pharma companies. Is that what you think it was only motivated by political pressure on David Cameron? Yes, and the pressure is enormous. It's brought by the companies themselves, but it's also brought by patient organizations, which are often really as fronts for the company. It's been alleged, for example, he said it costs a, a billion pounds to develop a drug but it's certainly been suggested that only about a tenth of that is actually the drug development cost. The rest is PR, advertising, marketing. And these are very big global companies. They have, they have clout. They have more power than the government in lots of ways. It, and the government's got to stand up to it. Well, is this now the government standing up to big pharma? Professor Sakura, what do you make of the idea I, I saying that, if they don't lower the prices, yeah. we're not going to pay for the drugs yeah. anymore? They are doing that. Um, the Cancycler example is a great one. They've turned down by NICE, they've asked to come back with a different proposal which would lower the number of the cost per quality, and they haven't done so. And they're all in the press beating each other around the head. I think the sadness for me as a doctor is when you see the emotional effect on a patient today. A woman maybe who's failed on her septum that would be a good candidate for Cancycler and she has to go through a procedure for individual funding request on the cancer drugs front. But just to be really clear on this proposal, you back the idea of the government saying unless you put the price down big powerful drug company we will not fund this drug at all i back that but i think one has to have an escape clause so doctors can prescribe a drug that they think will be the best thing for their patient and that's the conflict and you know, David's right, it's a political stunt. I mean, you've got NICE, that's the assessor, and the assessor turns it down. How can you have a back door in? But that's to prevent the politicians losing faith coming up to an election. David, what do you make of the idea of axing it then? Carl seems to think it's the right way to go. I think it's the only way to go. They, they, you have to stick it up against these big companies. They'll probably back down in the end. But they, they won't, certainly won't do it easily. It's, it's, it's terrible for patients, of course. But, but it, what we have to be clear is that although you know, cancer survival has improved, that many of these new drugs are very marginal improvements. On Cadsila, the extra life you get compared with standard treatment is, is less than six months, and that's not very much for, for £100,000. I think the hope is that by understanding the molecular targets of these drugs, we can predict which patients will respond, and then I think everyone will be happy, because although the drugs would be expensive, we wouldn't be using them in patients that aren't going to respond. So, for example, I've got a patient with lung cancer that's been kept alive for two years now on a drug that costs £120,000 a year, but he's in the 4% group that will benefit from that drug, and we can predict that. Isn't the bigger problem, though, is as David suggests, that with enormous respect, medical professionals like you, the research industry, is enormously reliant on the big pharmaceutical companies. Unless taxpayers want to suddenly start paying an awful lot more tax, they're going to have power over governments. They are. There's they no, are? Yeah. You say that yourself? Yeah, yeah they, they do. But I think what's happened with uh, Cancycla is a great example of people standing up to it. Now the problem for the companies, they can't sell it at one price in France and half the price to the NHS, otherwise there'd be what's called parallel importing, you would just ship the stuff around Europe. And uh, so there has to be some way of coming to an agreement, and I'm sure there will be in the next two months. David? Well, Roche made 7.7 billion profit last year, I think. Uh, they, they can afford 
to reduce the price. They just won't, because once they've done it, they'll be expected to do it again, of course. But they just cannot go on living in this style for drugs which don't actually work at all well, very many of them. Uh, in, uh, you know, if, 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 I was, if I was terminally ill, yeah. and, and they, they said, if you have this drug for £100,000, well, it's difficult to say what you feel when you're terminally ill, but you can have four months of uncomfortable life extra. I, I'm not sure what I, I would say that I was, it was my duty not to bother with it. <laughs> I think the problem is easy to intellectualize when you haven't got cancer. Oh, yeah, if yeah. you have got cancer, and I see people every day that have the disease, they want everything, they're desperate, especially younger people with families. Two months to them is worth having. And studies have shown that, that for 1% benefit, people will take the drug. If you haven't got cancer, it's not so important. But I do take your point about the balance within the health service in general. How do we prioritize? Various politicians go with the voters, and the voters vote for the NHS, and they vote for cancer as the most important worry they have about the NHS. So politicians follow that. C cancer is terrifying, and that's why that's the target for the, for the companies. Uh, and it's also, of course, the target for a lot of quacks as well, who immediately <laughs> surround anyone with cancer wishing to poke them with pins or give them a verbal okay. concoction. Okay. Well, we must leave it there, gentlemen, but we'll see full details from the government tomorrow. David Colquhoun and Professor Carl Sikora, thanks very much indeed for joining us. Now, in this country, we tend to...